saw it laying on the floor, I really didn't know what it was. It was about an inch long, and about the same thickness as a piece of bacon. Except I didn't think it could be bacon. It had hair on it. Oh. Later, the police picked it up and did some tests on it, and figured out what it really was. It became a main piece of evidence during the murder trial. Oh, what murder trial, you're probably asking? I'll explain. It all happened one evening back in June of 1966. I was working as a waitress at the Log Cabin Bar up near Ronan. Morty and Rose Bacon had been shopping down in Missoula. On the way home, they stopped by the bar to have a couple of beers. Well, one thing led to another. Before too long, they started arguing with each other. The argument ended with Morty standing up and throwing a beer bottle against one of the walls. He had shattered into a million pieces. Morty then stormed out of the place. He went out into the parking lot, got in his car, and just sat there trying to cool off. Well, as I said about cleaning up the pieces of the broken bottle, I heard some more commotion over in the corner of the bar. Edmo and his buddy Jensen and a couple of other guys were shooting pool and carried on like usual. It sounded like another fight was starting up, but look, I didn't pay a whole lot of attention to it at first. I mean, somebody was always fighting with somebody else in that place, you know? Anyway, just as I finished sweeping up the glass, I turned and saw one of Morty's friends, Vic, standing just inside the door. He had a look on his face, like a guy who was looking for trouble. Unfortunately, trouble found him first. Before Vic even knew it, Edmo and Jensen jumped him. Vic tried to get loose, but Jensen and Edmo commenced to beating him and kicking him something fierce. It didn't take more than a minute or so before Vic was lying on the floor, not moving. Next thing I knew, Actually, it was probably five minutes later, but it seemed like the next thing. I saw Morty come through the back door. He looked at Vic lying on the floor and then started walking toward Edmo, asking him what the hell had happened. Before Edmo even answered, Jensen punched Morty square in the face. Morty staggered sideways and fell to the floor, whereupon Edmo and Jensen piled on top of him and commenced to wail it on him. Jensen managed to pin Morty's arms down while Edmo kept hitting them. A few minutes later, I heard a horrible scream. Edmo and Jensen let go. Morty scrambled to his feet and ran out of the bar, holding the side of his head. About that time, Vic began moaning. Edmo yelled at him to shut up and then started kicking him. Vic grunted a couple of times and rolled over. He was trying to get up. So Jensen came over and kicked him, too. Right about then, Morty came back in. He was holding a pistol. He stared Edmo straight in the eyes and said, Now get smart, Edmo, or something like that. <laughs> Look, there wasn't no doubt in my mind that Morty wanted the whole thing to stop. If I would have been Edmo, I would have just raised my hands and walked out of that place. But that's not what he did. He curled his hands into fists instead and made a move like he was going to charge at Morty. At that point, of course, I think Morty knew that Edmo was going to put him in that same condition just as he had put poor Vic. So Morty fired. As Edmo was falling to the floor, Jensen started toward Morty. So Morty shot him, too. Which brings me back to what was lying on the floor. <laughs> At Morty's murder trial, there was a lot of testimony about why Morty left and then came back inside with a gun. I know why he did it, and I figure the jury did too. Look, Edmo had already beat Vic to a pulp, and he had bit off Morty's ear. And Morty, well, he just wasn't going to take no more violence from them. I think every single person on that jury, seven women and five men, knew in their own hearts that if somebody bit off their ear, They'd probably do just what Morty done. Try to stop the fight, but do it in a way that wasn't going to cost them any more body parts. <laughs> Plus, something a lot of people don't understand is that in some tribal cultures, getting your ear bit off is regarded as a sign of cowardice or defeat. If you ask me, that's why Morty got acquitted. Oh, that's a real case. <laughs> And you can't.
make this stuff up. No, you can't. No, you can't. Yeah, although I did make up the bartender, the, the waitress that was narrating, she's a friend of mine, uh, the substance of what she said is all in the court record, including the statement that she saw the, bar, the barmaid saw something lying on the ground that she thought was bacon, but didn't really think it was bacon. And it turned out it was bacon, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, that was a story, obviously, and it's a history that is easier to remember than if you just told the dry tale about two people that got in a fight in the bar, blah, blah, blah. So what am I doing here? Um, I spent 35 years as a trial lawyer, and most of it in criminal law, and most of it represent, all of it representing defendants, people who got themselves into trouble. I go into the courtroom and tell my story, tell their story, listen to the prosecutor tell their story, and then the jury would come back sometimes with an altogether different story. And it made me wonder, if a trial is supposed to be a search for the truth, what the hell is that? <laughs> that, that they just said, because the prosecutor and I are looking at each other across the aisles, saying, where did those facts come from? <laughs> of course, today we live in an era where facts are what yeah, we want exactly. them to be, so uh, yeah. I suppose that was all training for me. But, uh, uh, so what is truth? Um, let's, uh, that's a great old African proverb that I have used off and on through my years. And what it emphasizes is point of view. Um, whoever tells the story tends to put their point of view into the story. Um, and so we don't hear any stories told by lions, so all we get to hear about is how the great hunter went out and killed the lion. So truth, truth uh, in court is often told through the point of view of the eyewitness. And most people, whether they've been on a jury or not, tend to think, well, that's probably the purest form of truth you can find, because after all, if this witness saw what happened, and they tell us what happened, well, then we don't need to argue about it, because that's the truth. But the problem with that is, <clears throat> we're all human, and eyewitnesses are as imperfect as anybody else. And one of the things we've learned as a society and as a justice system, as well as learned as lawyers, is that people's points of view affect the stories that they tell. If you're being interrogated as a witness by a police officer, and he asks you, did you see a tall man in a mustache? That can affect your memory of that moment. And a year later, when you're called to take the stand in the case, what you remember is tall man mustache. Whether or not that was someone that you saw, because the person who asked the question has planted that suggestion in your mind. This is all by way of leading up to some of the stories that I'll tell that are in my books. Truth and perception. So I'm going to show you a picture here. And I want you to just take a look at it. There's no quiz questions involved. I just want you to take a uh, look at it, and then I'll ask you a question. Okay. That's the person who ran out of the bank. Right? Do you feel like you can tell the police the description of the person? I don't know. This guy with the mustache. There's two. Okay, how many people saw one person in that picture of a, a, a Scottish guy with a mustache? Okay, how many, anybody see two people? Anybody see three people? Good for you, okay. Let's take another look at it. You can see, looking off in that direction is a guy with a big brushy mustache and a, and a, a Scotch hat, right? Like a woman. But if you look right here, that's the mouth of an older woman. Right. There's her nose, right? Yeah. And she's looking this direction. Right. But there's a third person in the picture, and that's a young woman that's walking right. around. Mm -hmm. right. yep. And so if you were to tell the police what the person looked like, and you had actually seen that image, you might say, you know, I'm not quite sure. You know, I, I, I mean, I, I might have seen an old man, I might have seen a younger woman. Now, in reality, what we see is not quite as humorous as that, but it's often confusing. And it's particularly influenced if the officer says, I'm going to show you a picture of the suspect, the man that we believe may have pulled this off. Of course, they don't do that anymore because that's suggestive, but right. you get my point, so there it is. So that's, that's the example here. That's one of the challenges in deciphering history and writing about history, as I did in my books, is to go to the historical record, try to learn about the event, 
and then try to separate out truth, whatever that is, from legend or something else that may have come down through the years, like the game that you tell, you sit around a circle and you and you tell, you whisper in somebody's right. ear, yeah. and what comes back by the time you get to the end it's is not often anything quite different started, yeah. from what it started out with. Uh, that's Tom and Curly, and they are two characters who narrated stories for me about the, the uh, Bighorn County Courthouse sitting out on the National Monument at the Little Bighorn Battlefield. Um, are they real? Are they real? Or are they legendary? Uh, you have to read the book and decide for yourself. <laughs> but the point is, there's lots of ways to tell stories. Um, so that brings me up to me and, and what I did and what my books are about and what I'm up to in my life now that I've walked away from practicing law. And the, the story of my journey begins at the end, which is the epilogue, which is the last chapter of the last book that I wrote. Those four books are all interrelated in the sense that they're stories from courthouses all over Montana. There's no particular order to the stories. Each chapter deals with a different courthouse, and each chapter has different stories within it. So you can read the 12th chapter of book three, and then the first chapter of book one, and you can not have any interruption of your, of your train of thought. But what basically happened is during the years that I was a lawyer, I'm trying not to make this about me, but i got to set up some of the stories. <laughs> during the years that I was a lawyer, I became very uh, frustrated, cynical, um, concerned about what was going on and what people were doing to each other and how the justice system, so-called, was handling the problems that were brought before it. And so when I walked away, right before I walked away, I really reached a point where I didn't have any faith in much anymore, uh, including the rules that were supposed to be followed. And that was five years ago or so, and that's before even the current environment today. One day I was driving across, before I, before I retired, I was driving across Montana to go to a meeting in, uh, in Billings. And I stopped in White Sulphur Springs, and that's the courthouse at uh, White Sulphur Springs in Mark County. And I knew basically two things about Mark County. I had done no advanced research, had no <coughs> purpose in being there. I was just passing through and I saw the courthouse and I said, wow, you know, a courthouse out here in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> what did we waste our money on that for, right? I mean, um, and so I went inside and I, and I walked around and, uh, and got to see the place. But I knew basically two things about Mark County. One was that it was named for Thomas Francis Marr, former governor. We all know the stories of him. Amazing biography, amazing life story. And the second thing I knew was that from something I had read, back in 1917, the, uh, the authorities in Mark County had hanged uh, uh, three people for a murder on a, on a robbery and murder that occurred on one of the trains that was passing through the area. They dragged him back to uh, Mark County and put him on trial, convicted him, and hanged him, triple hanging. And the barn, uh, the, the gallows that was used is currently on display now down in Nevada City, and I guess that's my connection, how I do it. So I asked myself, why is this courthouse here? What is our justice system all about? And there must be a reason this courthouse is here. There must have been things that have gone on inside. I have no idea what they are. Well, what if these walls could talk? And that led me to this journey that I went on to cross the state and write these four books. Um, in the basement of the Mar County Courthouse, the clerk that I met, there was really no one else in the courthouse or probably even in the town that day. <laughs> uh, we went down into the basement and here was this hodgepodge of old cardboard boxes stacked up to the ceiling and everything else. And she said, you want to know about Mar County? Knock yourself out. <laughs> you know, th this is the history of our courthouse. It wasn't indexed. Th these things were wow. very loosely organized. I swear to you, this is a true story. I said, well, why don't we take a look and, and see if we can find anything interesting? Because I didn't know what I was looking for, and I hadn't come up with this project idea yet. I reached in, I pulled down one of the boxes, reached in and pulled out an envelope, reached into the envelope and pulled out the actual death warrant for Harrison Gibson, who was one of the three men who was killed. Wow. Uh, I mean, what are the odds? Yeah. Was, that, was that a message to me that I was supposed to be doing something with these ideas? And isn't that interesting that history is all around us? And we're losing it as we transition from one era to the next. I've been in every courthouse. I've handled files, and some of them are dissolving in our hands. There is no organized purpose uh, on, a, on a large scale 
to preserve stuff. Some counties are ahead of others. That's, a, uh, I guess, a result of how much money is available and so forth. I just pass that along. Anybody know who this gentleman is and what the story is? That is Judge Cr Charles Crum, who used to preside in Rosebud County in Forsyth. Uh, I'm going to read you uh, the tale of Judge Charles Crum that I took from my book. Uh, this is uh, sort of ex uh, extracting some of the main points of the story. It's a sedition story, and this is the 100th anniversary of not only World War I, but all the sedition madness that swept over Montana and the country as the United States geared up to go fight the war to end all wars, the war to save the world for democracy, and so forth. Uh, 100,000, or hundreds of thousands of American young men and women lined up, mostly men, they couldn't get on the ships fast enough to go to Europe and fight the war. And 100 years later, we still don't know what that war was really fought about. And, and 100,000 Americans died in it, and millions died on the European front. Charles Crum was the elected district judge for Rosebud County, got elected in 1912. He resigned in 1918 after the Montana State House of Representatives filed articles of impeachment against him and began proceedings and held a trial in the Senate to impeach him. What was his offense? He was of German descent, he spoke with an accent, and had a habit of trying to be fair to all sides even those with whom most people disagreed. The worst of his actions was to release three so-called rabble-rousing socialists who were members of the IWW, something I'm sure I don't have to explain to people who live in view. They were the so-called wobbly men, the international workers of the world, the union that was trying to break down uh, corporate corruption and trying to bring some fair working conditions to the people that worked. Uh, on the streets and in the mines and so forth. Uh, Feltner Haynes, who's a very famous Montana trial lawyer, was the Rosebud County attorney from 1916 to 1918. 1918, immediately after this event with Judge Crum, he resigned and went off uh, to take a commission and go to Europe for the war. Came back, got reelected in 1922, and he served for another 10, 12, or 12, 14 years. In January of 1918, uh, Feltner Haynes, the county attorney, decided that the Wobbly men were, had crossed the line and they were being unpatriotic and seditious. So he arrested them and ordered them to stay in town. He was going to drive over to Helena from Forsyth to uh, consult with the U.S. attorney to find out what could be done from a, uh, from a legal point of view. After he left town, the judge called the men into the courthouse and told them that if, if he were one of them, he would take the train to Helena get to the U.S. Attorney to talk to him before Haynes had a chance to work his magic. When Haynes found out that Judge Crum had done that, these men did in fact get on the train and go to Helena. When Judge uh, Crum found, uh, when uh, County Attorney Haynes found out that Judge Crum had done that, he was so mad that he filed a petition with the state legislature accusing the judge of sedition. In response, as I said, the House of Representatives voted articles of impeachment. The Senate began a three-day impeachment trial on the floor of the state Senate. Judge Crum was in very poor health at the time. His teenage son was dying of cancer, and he was under attack from the forces of zealotry that were committed to his destruction. He had a defense to the charges, but even his closest friends counseled him that his emotional health was too delicate at the time to warrant a long fight on the floor of the, of the Montana legislature, particularly since it would all be publicized. As a result, he did what most reasonable people in that circumstance with the boot heel of the justice system on their neck would do. He agreed to step down from the bench to resign. And he did so believing and understanding that that move would bring an end to the matter. Unfortunately, it didn't. The unwarranted public censure that arose in the press from the fact that he was removed in the impeachment process, as a result of the impeachment process, forced him to relocate to North Dakota. Even there, his, uh, his uh, enemies from Montana pursued him, found him, and continued to try and tarnish his record. Um, his subsequent slow descent into alcoholism and depression, coupled with uh, more family tragedy, led him to leave North Dakota and move to Kansas, where he lived with his sister until he died in 1945, alone and largely forgotten at the age of 71. The question about Judge Crum is, was he in fact disloyal, dishonest, deceitful, or unprincipled? 
Well, here's what the newspaper in Forsyth, Montana wrote about him at the time. There is no judge on the bench today in this state that is held in higher esteem than Judge Crum by the members of the bar who have had occasion to transact legal business before him. And here's the wording of a resolution that was presented to the state legislature by the citizens of the town of Roundup, Montana, which was also one of the towns that Judge uh, Crum presided in. Judge Crum is known as an honest, honorable, and upright man and an able lawyer, a fair and impartial, fearless, and conscientious judge, impervious to personal and political influence. His personal and judicial record during his official career is above reproach and suspicion. There's the conflict for and against Judge Crum. 73 years later, on February 6, 1991, the Montana State Senate reversed itself and exonerated Judge Crum long after his death. The vote was unanimous. There's some figures from the sedition stories. The sedition tales are woven through my four books. Every county, for the most part in Montana, dealt with this, this uh, fanaticism, this rage. That's uh, Janet and W.K. Smith who ran the post office in Sale in uh, what's now Powder River County between uh, Broadus and Miles uh, City. Uh, they got arrested. Here's what, uh, here's what Janet got sentenced to prison for 26 years for saying. In her post office, in the small town of Sale, which as far as I know doesn't even exist anymore, she said, instead of imposing food restrictions on decent, hard-working folks, the government should just kill all the cripples, mentally ill people, and criminals. Jeez. Now, you know, where's the line between free speech and exhortation to violence, particularly when you're speaking to an audience of probably three people that come into your post office? What did her husband say? He said everyone in America would be better off if there was a revolution which removed the president from office. For that, they got sentenced on a felony charge of sedition to the Montana State Prison. Over here is an article about Florence Miltner, the first woman convicted of sedition in Montana. Her seditious statement was, quote, I hope the Germans get every American who goes over there, unquote. These are people with strong roots to their family heritage in Europe who are out on the plains of Montana working hard to make a living for themselves and their families. Okay, so Carmen San Diego. Anybody know where Newman... Newland, Newland, Montana is. Never heard of it before. No reason you should, because there it is. Oh, no. <laughs> All right. Once upon a time, Newland, Montana, like other places in Montana, was a tavern, a store, uh, a few other buildings, and it was a it was a uh, a accepted way stop between um, uh, I think it was between Sydney and. Uh, up in the northeast corner of the state. Um, uh, there's a great story that comes out of Newmont, which is in the book, which I'll just touch on today. <laughs> it's a Montana outhouse story, which is also a Montana courthouse story. Those are the actual case files. Every, every story told in the book has an actual case file. Uh, I'm a trial lawyer, so what I say about what happened, go prove it if you don't think it really happened that way. But the outcomes are recorded in the case files, and the basic facts of the case are stated in the case files. There was a ne'er-do-well guy named Dan Keaton. John Olinger, whose name's on the bottom line, owned Olinger's Tavern and ran it. He was, uh, he was a figure in the community in the area and provided services to uh, lots of people who lived in the area many of whom came into his tavern and uh, uh, provided business for him. I know in view you don't know anything about taverns. Oh, but uh, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, Bollinger's Tavern was, a, was an accepted place. There was a ne'er-do-well uh, uh, transient guy named Dan Keaton who was sort of a uh, laborer type guy. He went to work for Olinger briefly and he was uh, so difficult to get along with and so tr uh, such a troublemaker that Olinger 86 him out of the bar said, uh, don't come back. You know, I don't want to see you anymore. I don't want you to work here. And he just should move on. He wasn't, Keaton wasn't from there. Keaton didn't take it well. So he went off and cooked up a little, uh, a little plan, came back, put explosives in the outhouse, presumably with the intent to kill Mr. Ollinger. The explosives blew up. 
might say, well, shut up, please. <laughs> Fortunately, Olger was not injured. Whether he was in the outhouse or on his way to the outhouse or what the demolition mechanism was uh, is not really recorded to history. The sheriff came, arrested Mr. Keaton, took him down uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, Glendive, who was a large county at that time, back in 1908. Put him on trial. They charged him with uh, uh, malicious mischief and uh, 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 creating a hazard because they couldn't prove that he had, actually had the intent to kill Mr. Olger. Keaton did his time in the jail, which was a misdemeanor sentence of several months. When he got out, people would have thought that was the end of it, but it wasn't. Keaton came back and with his jaw set, walked into the to Olger's uh, tavern uh, and uh, challenged him. Olinger pulled the gun out from behind the bar, told him to leave, he didn't leave. The gun went off. Mr. Keaton was killed. Mr. Olinger was arrested and tried for murder. The entire uh, regional community came down to the courthouse to support him, and he was acquitted. Uh, very interesting uh, little story from the past. There's Jordan. Um, we've all driven through Jordan on our way somewhere else. I don't know anybody that goes to Jordan to be in Jordan, unless they're visiting some of the 12 people who live there. I mean, there's a summary of the Jordan courthouses, and there, there's one of their older courthouses up in the corner, one of the original courthouses. There's the fire in the upper right-hand corner. There's a long story about the fire that burned down the courthouse back in the early 90s. It's tied in with the whole Freeman story, and oh. many of you remember that. Yeah. Here's the, here's the so-called new current functioning courthouse, which really looks more like a hospital than yeah, anything else, nursing but home. that's the building. <laughs> and then on the lower right, there is what looks like a chicken coop. And the story of that is a great story that was told by, I found someone in Jordan who told me the story, and I cobbled together sort of a fictional account, like the one you heard at the beginning, uh, of a trial that was in the early days of Garfield County that was actually held in a cabin out on a ranch because the judge was trying to accommodate people and there wasn't a courthouse to speak of. They would have trials in whatever large or large enough facility they could find. So they had the trial in the cabin and when the evidence was completed, the judge said to the bailiff, the sheriff, the deputy, take the jury to the jury room to begin their deliberations. And they all looked at each other <laughs> and they wound up deliberating the chicken. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> and the report, this fellow's grandfather had been on the jury, and the report was it was the fastest jury deliberation. <laughs> they should do that nowadays. <laughs> okay, anybody know why Sheridan County in the far upper north uh, east part of the state is referred to as the Red Corner? Affectionately. The reason is not what I originally thought when I saw the description. I thought, oh, that's a place, pardon this expression, Statement. That's a place I don't ever want to go because I'm bright blue. I live in Missoula. I don't ever want to go up into a red corner. I'll be surrounded. That's not what it means at all. And there's a book that I brought with me today. Just It's called uh, The Red Corner, ironically enough. Oh. And it's written by a woman named Berlaine Stoner McDonald who grew up in Plentywood. And it's the story of the communist uh, domination, the Communist Party's domination, of local Sheridan County politics and the courthouse um, for a number of years in the 30s, back right about the time after the great, leading up to and after the Great Depression in the early years of the 30s. Um, so from that courthouse up in uh, Plentywood in uh, Sheridan County comes an interesting little case. And it's a what would you do? Uh, in January of 1997, a Montana Highway Patrolman by the name of Del Kranzler was traveling back to uh, Plentywood on Montana Highway 5 on his way back from a little town called Westby. Anybody ever heard of Westby, Montana? <laughs> Westby bills itself as the easternmost town in Montana. The irony of that is Westby is east. So I wondered, whether, I wondered whether there was an East Bee that was the westernmost. But there was, I think Troy up in, the, up in Lincoln County is about as far west as you can go. It's still out of town. But anyway, uh, the officer stopped the car, and we all know the story. There it is. We, of course, none of us have ever been there, but 
We know the drill. Field sobriety tests administered, suspicion of alcohol, odor of alcohol about his person. Uh, sir, I'm going to have to ask you to step into the car and take you down to the police station so we can do uh, a blood, I mean a, a breathalyzer, breath sample, you take a breath sample. And the driver uh, acknowledged, uh, I'm in trouble. <laughs> I better think of something. What would you do? You know, you smell like alcohol, you know you've been drinking, you didn't do too well in the field sobriety test, and you know you're dead man walking if they get the blood alcohol, I mean the uh, breathalyzer reading on you. So, right before they were ready to administer the breathalyzer, he said to the officer, I really got to pee. I really got to pee. And the officer said, well, all right. The officer walked with him to the restroom and stood outside. What do you suppose this guy did? He drank urine. Oh. Is that right? What's that? He ate the urine, urine cake? Oh, he ate the cake. What's that? Santa flush. That's Santa flush. Uh, no, that's what we call uh, a urinal cake. And it sits in the urinal to help dissipate the odor of urine. As you're yearning. Oh dear. And when the when the <laughs> defendant walked out of the bathroom, he had blue all over his lips. Oh, oh god. god. I don't have to tell you anything else about this. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> story really is so we're, we're gonna run out of time on some of these stories, but I gotta tell you uh, one of my favorite stories uh, that comes from up in uh, in in uh, Chester. And uh, there's the Liberty County Courthouse, and up, up superimposed on the courthouse, obviously, is a picture of the courtroom. And Liberty is another one of Montana's small counties. It's up on the high line just uh, west of uh, Hill County. Um, that's the courthouse. It's been there since the county was formed back in the, around 1920 or so. Um, so when I went up to, when I, when I went up, I, I've been to every courthouse and talked to all the clerks. And when I went up to, to Chester, I happened to know uh, sort of loosely my man, uh, Silas Melton, who's the clerk up there. And so when she heard I was coming, she said, I've got to call my mother and get her in here. She has a story to tell you. So I was up there in the morning, and in the late morning, her mother came in. Her mother preceded her as a clerk of court in Liberty County, and she goes back more, you know, more than 30 years with her service to Liberty County as a clerk. So she told me a story about uh, a late afternoon in 1985 when whatever was going on in the Liberty County Courthouse, and again, there wasn't a whole lot going on the day I was there, the phone rang, and she picked up the phone, and a voice, a young man's voice, appeared to be a young man, said, hello, I'm calling from California. Um, my grandmother is dying, and she's telling the family that she killed a man in Montana. And we've asked her for details, and all she keeps saying is Chester. And we don't know whether that's the guy that she supposedly killed, or we looked at, on the map of Montana and we saw Chester, and, and so we're just calling you to see if you can help us. And that's all we know, and frankly, Grandma's kind of over the edge, and we kind of don't know if she really even knows what she's talking about. And so the clerk said, well, I, that's not much to go on. Let me see what I can find out. So a few days went by, and she went into the boxes of cases and found a story. <laughs> and I don't know if I got my sound tuned up there, but that's the lyrics from uh, Chicago. From, if you've seen the movie Chicago, where uh, uh, she says, he had it coming, if you'd have been there, you'd have agreed with me. And here's the story, which I'll read you, that, uh, that goes along with Grandma from the telephone call. The shooting occurred in December of 1920. John Hole was a ranch hand working for James Philippin. As part of his agreement with Philippin, Hole rented a room in the Philippin house. Also living in the house were Mr. Philippin, his wife Edith, and their two children. One evening while Mr. Philippin was in town, Hole let himself into Edith's darkened bedroom. The story as she later related it was chilling. Hole forced her to come to, with him across the room into his own room pushed her down on the bed, and began to kiss her. She fought him, but was unable to get him off her. Come on, kid, he said to her, as he began to sexually assault her. 
I always get what I want. I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you. She began to protest, reminding him that she was married with kids. In fact, her kids were sleeping in the next room. He didn't stop until he heard a noise, which was Mr. Philipman pulling up in his truck out front. At that point, Hole pulled her off the bed, shoved her into the hallway, and told her to go back to her own bedroom. By the time Edith had calmed down enough to explain to her husband what had happened, John Hole had climbed out the window and left. Now, back in those days, a married woman just didn't report an incident like that to the police. A week later, John Hole returned to the ranch to receive some of his clothes and possessions. Mr. Philippon, who was in the middle of loading a calf into a wagon, growled at him and told him to get the hell out of here. Get what you got and get out of here. Hole walked into the house and saw Edith. She testified later that he looked directly into her eyes and said, I'm going to get you again, kid. You'll do what I ask. Edith was shaking like a leaf. Those are her own words. When he repeated the same command as she later explained, her blood boiled over. She went into the pantry, picked a rifle off one of the shelves, and shot him. Mr. Philippin heard a faint noise. He described it as a door banging. And then he saw his wife come running out of the house, crying that she had shot John Hole. Philippin and another ranch hand ran toward the house and found Hole lying on the front steps. He was bleeding, but he was clear-headed. Philippin asked him what had happened, and Hole replied he'd had an accident and he needed to go to the hospital. Philippin and the other ranch hand helped Hole into the car and drove him to the hospital in Haver. Gangrene set in, and John Hole died later that evening. Edith was arrested and taken to court, charged with first-degree murder. I'm sorry I did it, she told the judge, but I wanted to hurt him. If he had only left when I asked him, there would have been nothing more to it. Hole raped her, the prosecutor told the jurors at the trial, and would have done it again unless she stopped him once and for all. On the first day of July, 1921, a unanimous jury in Liberty County found her not guilty of homicide. She left Montana shortly afterwards and never mentioned it to anyone for the rest of her life until she told her grandchildren on her deathbed 60 years old. History's all around. It's amazing what you find when you go looking for it. Um, a couple, uh, a couple, few more minutes here. There's the old story about an infinite number of monkeys. If you give an infinite number of monkeys an infinite number of typewriters, eventually they'll type, they'll type every book ever written. Um, you've probably heard that before. There's variations of it, but that's based on laws of probabilities and so forth. And obviously, infinite gives you a lot to work with there. Um, why did I put that up? Well, as I, as I went through this process, this project, and I learned all these stories and I, and I tried to figure out which ones I wanted to put in the book and which ones I didn't, I, I, I figured out pretty quick that just about every story that's ever come into a courthouse has been told before. Um, there's only, you know, as amazing as it is, if you look hard enough, you're going to find the same story somewhere else. And that is, and I came to that recognition because of one of my favorite movies, My Cousin Vinny, which, oh, yeah. is, which is about, <laughs> it's about a murder case down in Alabama where his, his, uh, his cousin, or his, his uh, uh, yeah, his cousin gets arrested, a young boy with, a young uh, uh, man with his friend, they get arrested and charged with murdering a deputy sheriff in a, in a holdup at a convenience store. Um, and the key piece of evidence in the My Cousin Vinny case are tire tracks. And I got into that loop, remembering it, when I read about a case out of, uh, out of Bozeman um, that hinged to a large degree on tire tracks. In the early morning hours of December 23, 1964, a few of you in here might remember this case. A passing motorist came across the savagely beaten corpse of a female lying on the side of a country road not far from Bozeman. She was partially naked, her overclothes having been scattered into the adjacent brush. Her name was Bobby Clark. The police did an on-scene investigation, took pictures of tire tracks. This is back in the early 60s. Took pictures of tire tracks and did what most respectable law enforcement agencies would do, send them to the FBI and said, can you help us out? The FBI examined their, their tire track expert, 
examined the tire tracks, sent back a report saying that the tires were Cordovan tires, a low-profile tire that was in uh, you know, fairly widespread use. So they had, so the, so the Bozeman authorities, Gallatin County authorities, had a report from the FBI suggesting that perhaps the tire, the person that was involved in this homicide, was driving a car with uh, Cordovan tires on it. Well. Everybody wants to help everybody, and there was a local uh, tire merchant who caught wind of the story. Everybody was up in arms because it was a pretty brutal homicide. And he decided to take a look at the pictures, and when he did, he came to his own conclusion and said, those aren't Cordovan tires, those are Crest Imperial tires. I couldn't tell a Cordovan from Crest Imperial, but that's what you get to when you get into expert witnesses. And this guy, the local tire salesman, said, that's a Crest Imperial tire. And some people in the community took up that uh, mission and decided to go out and look, see if they could find some clues that would help the police. Uh, a particular good Samaritan went out looking and found a dis discarded Crest Imperial tire lying in the brush, uh, not too far from the crime scene, not right there, but in the vicinity, 500 yards, a mile, 10 miles, 50 miles, who knows. You know. <laughs> he came back with it and said, I found this kind of near the, the crime scene. And Furthermore, he reported to the police that it looked like it had been recently washed. So, you know that's what killers do, is they go wash their tires right. before they throw them in the bushes. <laughs> Armed with that evidence, the police interrogated a guy named Archie Warwick. Archie Warwick, uh, again, be before my time in Montana, but he was a, a, a varsity football player at Montana State University. Um, they brought him in for questioning. Questioning is not fun when there's a police officer standing on the other side of the table and you're alone in a room. And Archie answered all the questions that were given to him. And they determined after that that there was no reason to charge Archie with anything. Archie left and moved over to Seattle. I believe that's where he moved to. Five years later, the case sat there. Nobody had any clues because there were no other physical clues that would help. Um, uh, five years later, a friend of Archie's, a friend, uh, came to the police and said, you know, Archie and I were hunting once, and Archie, Archie was talking about the Bobby Clark murder, saying that he was really concerned about that, um, that, that, you know, that, that really bothered him a lot, and that, you know, uh, it was something that was pretty close to his heart. And based on that, the police decided, oh, well, let's see, he, he had tires that fit the description that these Good Samaritans had concluded were possibly the tires. And now he's made some statements that are no, that no longer exist, by the way. The, the tape recordings had been lost or destroyed. And what remained were a stenographer's uh, or a, a, a reporter's accounts listening and writing, which were not taken down verbatim. Based on that, they arrested Archie and put him on trial. Um, he went to trial twice before he got finally acquitted. Uh, uh, there's the Montana Supreme Court decision uh, reversing the first conviction and sending the case back. Um, I think I have time for one more story here, and uh, I, think, I think I'll tell this one because it really gives the flavor of kind of kind of what um, the book is like. That, that's, a, that's not a story I'll tell, but that's a story about a guy who got convicted of murder back in the 1920s. And he found out, after he got convicted, his lawyer found out, that the facts of the case are, you know, is self-defense? No, it isn't. Yes, it is. No, it isn't. Uh, and the dead guy is not there to say whether it is or isn't. Um, but they found out later that the jurors were drinking beer in the jury room. Oh, uh, right? jeez. There's the actual affidavit from one of the jurors. There are several who signed affidavits. And there's the key language, uh, a small quantity of intoxicated <laughs> was brought into the jury room, was lit in there drunk by members of the jury. Well, it's amazing how once they got busted, suddenly the beer became a small amount of beer. And <laughs> we only have a few sips and that sort of thing. Um, case went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, eh, I don't think there's anything wrong with drinking beer in the jury room. Um, <laughs> particularly since we don't have any jurors who said it made a difference. So, uh, so there you go. This is the last story. Uh, what does this guy have to do with the courthouse? Anybody recognize this guy? Okay, so here you go. I will tell you that this is the uh, great. This is the great white wolf of Judith Basin. He really lived. He walked the earth. And here's what I wrote about him 
extracted from my book and edited slightly for presentation today. Um, but this is this is the this is the uh, the framework that I use for storytelling when I go to a county. I try to figure out okay who can be my narrator, living, dead, or imaginary, and how are we going to get all these stories told? And you'll understand why the White Wolf of Stanford told me the stories when you hear this. I drove out to the Packard Homestead, where the old town used to be, the old town of Stanford. There's nothing there now except a single house, grassland sweeping to the far horizon, and cattle grazing contentedly. No sign at all of a place that once bustled with close to a thousand people of all sizes, shapes, and vintages. Slipping a backpack over my shoulder and climbing out of the car, I hopped the rail fence alongside the roadway and began to walk slowly out into the middle of the seemingly endless grassland that stretched to the horizon and beyond. The setting sun had dropped below the ridgeline of the Highwood Mountains to the west, and with every step, the shroud of gathering darkness closed tighter around me. Overhead, high in the big sky, the first wave of evening stars were emerging into full view. I had only walked a few hundred yards when, from behind me somewhere, I caught the faint echo of what sounded like a French horn. Or was it the bassoon, wafting through the crisp night air? I knew my ears were playing tricks on me, but for the life of me, it sounded like Prokofiev's Peter and the Wolf. <laughs> Shrugging, I stopped and tugged the backpack off my shoulder. Fishing out a pair of binoculars, I raised them to my eyes and squinted into the lens, trying to find the path of a barely, vi barely visible herd of elk as they meandered away from me into the darkness. I stared at them until they disappeared. It wasn't until I lowered the field glasses that I became vaguely aware of the fact that something or someone was behind me. With a rapidly growing sense of uneasiness, I turned around and found myself staring directly into the eyes one of the largest wolves I had ever seen. Fully six feet in length, from the crown of its majestic head to the end of its massive tail. A waxing gibbous moon had begun to climb above the horizon, and the tips of the beast's magnificent white coat shimmered like silver beads in the luminescent moonlight. I froze. The beast made no move to close the distance between us. Instead, standing as still as a statue, staring at me with a glowering ferocity, for an eternal moment, frozen in place, and not knowing whether to run or stand my ground, I cursed myself for wandering away from the safety of my automobile. A hundred jumbled, conflicting thoughts ran through my mind, and in response I simply stood there stupidly, waiting for a growl or some other assertion of dominance. At that moment, I would not have been surprised if the wolf had pounced on top of me. I would not have been surprised if the wolf had cautiously retreated. I would not have been surprised if it had begun to circle me, or if it had done any number of other things which one generally expects a wolf to do. Instead, it did the one thing which I could not have anticipated. It opened its mouth and spoke. <laughs> do you know who I am? It asked, feral eyes peering at me through the darkness. Slowly I began to regain my wits. You can't drive into or out of Judith Basin County without encountering road signs that trumpet the white wolf. You're the white wolf of Judith Basin, I stammered, <coughs> stating the what was by then very obvious fact. You terrorized ranchers and farmers in this area for almost 20 years, from around 1910 until the spring of 1930, single-handedly destroying hundreds of head of livestock. <coughs> Virtual armies of hunters tried unsuccessfully through the years to capture you or kill you. It was only after a local rancher, apparently a guy named Al Close, tracked you for hours through the high timber and shot you through the eye, that your reign of timber came to an end. That's correct, said the wolf. Fine, I said. What does any of that have to do with my interest in the Judith Basin Courthouse? The great white wolf, or at least the image of him that stood before me, lifted its head and cleared its throat. After the residents of Stanford finished gawking at me and pawing my carcass, they took me to a taxidermist and had me skinned and stuffed. Then I was placed in a sealed glass container and put on display in the lobby of the Judith Basin County Courthouse. I stood there for almost 75 years, watching and listening to every person in every case that wandered into and out of that courthouse. So, uh, that's the narrative style that I use. That's the storytelling. Uh, all sorts of people tell me stories. 
Here's a quick one. I won't tell you the story because some folks have said we're coming up on the hour anyway. The largest punitive damage award ever awarded in Montana District Court. It's a great story. It involves the work of C.M. Russell, Ivan Doig, Monty Dolak, or Gary Cooper. What do you think? Punitive damage award. A lawsuit. Punitive damages are awarded for unconscionable behavior. Somebody's doing something that is just shocking to the jury. The answer is Sam Russell. In the lower corner here, I'm just going to teach you with the story. In the lower corner here is the signature of C.M. Russell, right? So was that really painted by C.M. Russell? No. You know the story? <laughs> no, I don't. But you know that it's a story, right? Yeah. There's the Montana Supreme Court case. Uh, long story, a well, little bit long story made short. Uh, guy buys a painting in 1972 in New York City. He looks at it and says, oh, that's a Charlie Russell painting. Man, I'm buying that sucker. He buys it, takes it back, owns it for many years. About 1998, he decides to sell it. He goes to get an opinion, and they say, that's not a Charlie Russell painting. That painting was painted by a guy named O.C. Seltzer, who was one of Charlie Russell's uh, sort of apprentices. A very famous painter in his own, Montana painter, Western art painter, in his own right. But, you know, it's, there's Russell and then there's everybody else. And the difference in value is probably $70,000 for this painted wow. by, by Seltzer, and $700,000 if it's a Russell painting. Wow. The buyer gets, pardon the expression, pissed, because he can't get anybody to affirm that he's really got a Russell painting. So he files a lawsuit against the appraiser who gave him the bad news. The appraiser happens to be a guy named Steve Seltzer, who lives in Great Falls, and who is the grandson of O.C. Seltzer. Oh, but he, in his own right, is a very well-respected, nationally prominent art appraiser, art, art wow. uh, inspector. And he says, I'm sorry, it's just not, it's my grandfather's work. Uh, Morton, who happens to be the heir to the Morton salt industry, oh. so you know what kind of money we're dealing with, he gets upset and he says, you've defamed me, you've defamed my painting, uh, you've been unreasonable, I'm suing it. Goes to federal court in Great Falls, federal district court, files a lawsuit against Seltzer. They line up witnesses and every single expert witness supports Steve Seltzer and says, it's not a Russell painting, you know, uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that there's a signature on there, but it's not. It's art forgery. Who knew, right? So, so, so the judge throws the case out of federal court. And says there's no basis, there's no evidence on which to proceed. So by then, Mr. Morton's action has cost Mr. Seltzer fifty thousand dollars in attorney's fees. All right. I mean, attorneys don't come free, folks. Uh, I was a public defender for a lot of years, but that's different. Um, so. Mr. Seltzer, mostly his attorney, who is a top-notch attorney in Great Falls, said, all right, it's time for payback. They filed a lawsuit against Morton in, federal, in a, a Cascade County District Court in Great Falls. Case goes to trial. Jury says, uh, jury says, man, Mr. Morton, you got your head somewhere it doesn't belong, and you were outrageous. They award Mr. Seltzer a million dollars for his actual damages uh, pain and suffering, emotional distress, and are you ready? Wait for it. Twenty million dollars in punitive damages. Wow. And the Supreme Court, when the case finally gets to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court upholds it. The judge, Dirk Sandifer, who was the judge in Great Falls, studied it very carefully and reduced the punitive damages from twenty dollars, twenty million down to ten million, for reasons that are very understandable. Juries get carried away sometimes, and they have to have their their damage punitive damage awards, which are made up out of thin air. Punitive damage is how much am I going to punish you for what you did? And there's no standard to it. Uh, Judge Sanford looked at it, decided to reduce it to $10 million. The, the, uh, uh, Morton took it up on appeal to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court upheld everything that happened and called it a case of legal thuggery, what, what Mr. Morton had done to Mr. Seltzer. So uh, that's okay. That's right. We're, we're, we're winding up here anyway. So there's the last couple of things. The least populated county in Montana. Anybody know what that is? I gave you a clue. I'll show you where it is. I didn't know until I went there. It's Petroleum County. Petroleum County Courthouse in Lennon. That's the original courthouse. Uh, that's a little teeny courtroom that's in it. It's been the courtroom um, since, the, since the beginning of the county. And when I went there, I said, I'm here to look at all the cases that you've had. And they said, we haven't had very many. 
I mean, we, we just know how many people live here, and we've only had a, almost a literal handful of cases in the hundred years that they've been wow. counting. Wow. So what, it, what, was the, what was one of their cases that they knew about? There's the roadside to win it. There's a bar and grill in town, and there's the courthouse in the distance, so you can see how close everything is. It's called the, the, uh, the Happy Heifer Bar. <laughs> and no kidding, trial, a uh, case went to trial, two guys in the bar oh, got in a fight God. about which town was smaller. <laughs> when it or Hilda, a friend of mine, was actually the attorney for one of the, for, for the guy that, uh, that got charged. Uh, the argument wound up in a stabbing. And the stabbing wound up in a, in a felony charge, and the felony charge went to trial. And there's a whole great story about how they tried to get enough jurors to hear the case and whatever. And the whole point of it was, my, my town's smaller than your town. <laughs> <laughs> so there's my, uh, there's my novel that I wrote here, uh, a few years back when I was, oh, that's a great when I was decompressing <laughs> or, or trying to exercise some ghosts from all the frustration I had in the world. <laughs> It's a long story of a 20-year search for a killer and whatever. It's available if you read stuff on digital format. And there's my new uh, mystery that I'm working on, which is a fictional mystery, which is just shameless self-promotion here. <laughs> that's, that's about a Russell, a Russell painting to it, and it's a, it's a made-up story, which I'm looking forward to finishing. That's a good um, painting. And thanks for coming. Thank you. <laughs>